a more advanced topic, and that's looking at our simple and weighted averages. Remember when we talked about our elements, our isotopes? We had a mass number. That mass number we might expect to see on the periodic table, because the periodic table does give us some masses. And yet when we look at the numbers on the periodic table, none of them, as far as the mass goes, are whole numbers. Why were they not whole numbers? Those were averages for that isotope. Right? So when we had hydrogen, we had protium, deuterium, tritium. We have to take an average of their abundances. So how would we go through and do that with a calculation? Well, that's looking at a weighted average. Okay? So let's, a simple average assumes everything's equal concentrations or equal amounts. The weighted average takes into consideration that amount. Believe it or not, when you've gone through and done a standard average, you were assuming they were all equal concentrations. They were all equal percentages. You may or may not have realized that. So if we took a look at the average mass for, say, the element of hydrogen, we said there were three isotopes. We had protium with a mass of one. We had deuterium with a mass of two. We had tritium with a mass of okay, three different isotopes. To, term, to determine the average mass, we would then take the sum of those masses and divide by three. 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 Why three? That was how many types there were. There were three types. How much of each type? In our standard average, or our simple average, we've actually factored in how much of each type there was. 33%. In this average, I am assuming that there's 33% protium, 33% deuterium, and 33% tritium. That's in this calculation. Does anybody see 33%? No. no. Where is it? Oh, on the three. Okay. So let's play around with some mathematical algebra simplifying, or really not simplifying, but complicating it to see if we can't find it. This is the same as saying 1 over 3 plus 2 over 3 plus 3 over 3. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay. This is the same as saying 1 over 3 times the mass of that one, 1, plus 1 over 3 times the mass of that one, of deuterium, plus 1 over 3 times the mass of tritium. What is 1 over 3? 0.33. If I convert that into a percent, what do I have? 33%. 33% is already implied in my calculated average. Okay. We're assuming an equal weight. This applies across all averages. If you only have two samples, what is the assumed percentage? 50%. 50%. There's two things, one over two. Four things. We're assuming each is 25%. Right? So it is already embedded in how we do a simple average. Okay? So what we want to do is now create a new format that we can apply to our weighted averages that takes into consideration that percentage. Okay? But at the same time, it can't change the calculation of the weighted average, because if it, or the simple average. Okay? So we have to use the same type of calculation. We're just changing our formatting in it. So our weighted average... is going to be equal to the percent of our first substance, I'm just going to call it A, times the measurement for our first substance, plus the percent for our second substance, times the measurement for our second substance, plus the percent for the third. Whoops. Let's pay attention there. Measurement for the third. What if I have four substances? Do it again. I do it again. Percent for our fourth substance times the measurement for the fourth substance. What if I have 20 substances? I do it for each and every single one of those 20. Okay? 20 would suck, right? Yeah. We tend to sit in the two to three. <laughs> Keeps our calculations a little bit easier. Okay? But this formula will hold regardless of what you're looking at. So this weighted average still works as our simple average. Okay? 
But what we'd have to pull out of our simple average is recognizing that we're assuming they're all equivalent to each other to come up with the percentages. Kind of make sense? If we do a thumb check, I got a couple eyes saying yes. Okay, we're good. Okay, unfortunately, what I have just done is written that neat little formula up there. Okay, that formula is something that we can derive, and I would argue that I don't have it memorized because as tedious it may, as it may seem, I would derive it each and every time how I wanted to use it. But that's not a question to solve. And as soon as I hit the next button to bring up the question to solve, guess what's going to happen to the formula? It's going to disappear. Okay? So if you want access to that formula, you should write it down. If you don't care, then we won't worry about it. Are we good to move on? Yes, there it goes. Gallium has two isotopes. Gallium 69 with a mass of 68.926 AMUs. AMU, what the hell is an AMU? An atomic mass unit. Do we care what an atomic mass unit is? Eventually, maybe, but we haven't really evaluated how to measure things as far as mass or volume okay, or time. So don't stress about it. Just realize that that is a measurement of mass. Okay? It has an abundance of 60.11%. Okay? I also have a second isotope, gallium-71. What is the mass of gallium-71 in units of AMUs to four significant digits. The significant digits thing is a little bit weird because we haven't talked about it yet. I just want four numbers. Okay? That's all we're referencing. So what should we be doing to figure this out? Okay. I've got a suggestion that we can take that 60.11% and drop it into a decimal. Okay. Percent means what? Out of 100. So I can enter that in the calculator and it'll spit out 0 0.6011. Cool. I could have also written 42 up there. What is the relevance of 42? What's that? Forty-two plus sixty, does that get me a hundred? No. What is the relevance of forty-two? I don't know. I don't know what the relevance of forty-two is. Exactly. Was it point six oh one times? What I need is not just a number. What does that represent? The percent. It represents a percent. Percent of what? It's a percent abundance of what? That's the percent abundance of pineapple in the world. I don't know. It's the last I could come up with off the spur. Is that relevant to the question? No. So telling me that that's the percent abundance of pineapple is completely irrelevant to the question. Okay? Writing down a number is meaningless if you don't know what it means. What is the meaning of our 60.1? The meaning of our <coughs> .6011? Average what of gallium? So let's read the sentence. Gallium 69 with a mass of 68.926 is 60.11, 68.926 as a mass. No. So is this 60.11 mass? No. Is it a weighted average? Well, I don't even know about what that means. Where does the 60.11 show up? It's the percent abundance of gallium 69. Okay. You have to be tying that to that. That is roughly 
v percent, if we look at our previous formula that we had, that is the percent of A, where A happens to be what? Gallium 69. Okay. With that information, I can now start to use that formula that I had. If I don't have that information in there, what I'm doing is throwing numbers into a formula and hoping it works. For those of you saying that's worked in every class before, it will also work in this class. It'll work to get you the wrong answer because I know that's what students do. So on a multiple choice test, guess what I do? I go through and do all the possible multiplications and additions that you could do and make that one of the answer choices. You cannot just jam numbers in and hope it works. It will appear to work and you will get it wrong. Right? You need to understand what's happening. This is work. This is defining what those terms mean. That's what you need to do every time you solve a problem. Okay? That's not just chemistry. That's every class. Okay? That, unfortunately, is life. Okay? What else do we have in the question that we could potentially pull out of this? What do I have? I hear something about 71. What are you telling me about 71? Okay, I want to know the mass of gallium 71 equals a big question mark. Okay, if we apply this back to the symbols that we used before, is gallium 71 A? No. 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 So gallium 71 is B. Is it percent B or is it B? B. It's just B. It's our measured value for B. Okay. What other information do I have in this? It says gallium has two isotopes, so 60 by 1, 1 is gallium 69, 71 gallium must be the other isotope. So the... I have two isotopes. 39. Gallium 69 and gallium 71. Okay. What I'm also trying to write is as A and as B. Why would I go through and write as A and B? What's that? That references our formula. Okay. I would also argue 69 written in the upper right hand corner small followed by a large G A is a lot more complex to write than A. Simplify. Okay. If I know I only have these two isotopes, okay, there's only two things in the world, a head and a tail. When I flip that quarter, what do I expect to see? One of those two options. Of those two options. To what percent abundance? <coughs> 50 percent. There's only two possible options, right? particularly on a quarter. Every time I have a, a head, what do I also have? A tail. a tail. Is that true for gallium? Not exactly. What do you mean? Uh, there's 60.11 of gallium 69 boulders. In gallium 71, there's got to be 39. Point. Oh, I'm hearing this 39 point. What do you mean? What are you doing to get that number? I know that this equation must be true. With only two isotopes, they must total to 100%. That means I can solve for the percent of B. I know the percent of B. I know the percent of A. I know I'm solving for the value of B. Can I solve? Yes. Okay. I'm going to have to erase to get some space here. The percent of B, somebody with a calculator tells me the number is what? 39.89 percent. We can do the same thing that we did with our percent for A. And that'll be 0.3989. Okay, I need to get space, so I'm going to erase that. We had our formula, right? We had the percent of A, 0.6011, times the value of A. I'm going to leave a little bit of space there. I'll come back to that. Plus 0.3989 times the value of B, okay, equals... Do I know the value of A? Yes. According to my work, do I know the value of A? Yes. Where in my work do I know the value of A? 
Where in my work have I shown the value of A? You haven't. Don't just assume because it's written in the question you understand it. Most people don't. Write it down. You go, well, isn't that stupid? Isn't that a simple, stupid step? Yeah, it's a simple, stupid step that people get wrong consistently. Okay? Write that value down. What is our value for A? 68.926, which then means I can then sub into this equation and I can drop in my 68.926. Right? So far, so good? Okay. Please tell me how you solve that equation. Not yet. Somebody else, how do you solve that equation? Go ahead and try. Okay. So we take uh, percent A times A. Yep. And we get our number. Yep. 41.4314. Yep. Okay. And we throw 100. No. This is what I'm fishing for, yes. Yeah. He's saying 100. Where did the 100 come from? Percent. It's 100%. Okay. Right. Am I looking at a percent anymore? No, this is a mass times a percent. What the hell is that number? It can't be 100 anymore. Okay. To solve this equation, I can't. Literally impossible to solve this equation because I'm missing information. What is in that box? What are we solving for when we do this? It is the weighted average. The weighted average of what? The average for our element. I wish I had a table of things that listed the weighted average for all of my isotopes. Oh, I do. Gallium. And when I look at gallium, what do I find? The weighted average is? 69 point, sorry, 723. Can I solve the equation now? Yes. Yes. Now it's valid. Now you can punch in whatever you want. Calculator, well, not technically whatever you want. You've got to do the right order for everything. But you can now go through and solve that. Does that make sense? Okay. That's all the work you should be showing. Some of you are good enough that you can internalize some of that. In a multiple choice answer, by all means, you can internalize away. In a show your work, do not internalize that because I can't give you credit for it. I would also argue on a multiple choice test, do not internalize it. Because believe it or not, your brain, there's a reason there's this hard case around it that nobody can see into. Because that is a scary, scary place to be in. We do not want to be inside somebody else's brain. Which means, on a test, don't take the test inside your brain. You have gotten used to the scariness until you take a test. Okay? Then the scariness comes out and destroys you. Okay? Write it down. Now it's not in your brain. Now you can work with it. You can tame the beast. Kind of make sense? Okay. Do we need to work through that to solve to get an answer? If you say yes, that's fine. I just need to know. Yes. Okay. I need to erase some of this, and we're going to end up having to show the work going upwards because I just don't have the space anywhere else. So we'll clean all that work up so I have the space to work. Uh, Paul, you did the multiplication over there. You said it was 40-something. 41.4314. Go away. 41.4314. Correct. Okay. Plus our 0.3989B equals 69.723 AMUs. I'm trying to see numbers. How do I simplify? You can subtract on both sides. 314. Okay. 
When we do that subtraction, I know where you're going, Paul. That's just the next step, and I didn't have quite the legitimate space to crank that in. Um, what's our number here? 28.2916. 28.2916. Cool. That is like the first time I've ever listed a number correctly. How do I get the B by itself? I will divide both sides by 0.3989. Yeah, that whole space thing is still becoming a problem. And I get B equal to 240. Oh. 70.9240. 70.9240. I've got two people confirming. Anybody else want to confirm in that as well? Okay, three confirmations. I think we're good to go with that number. Okay. For the sake of the exam, perfectly happy with that. For the sake of the question, it said four significant digits. You've seen it in lab today. Okay, so that doesn't quite work for everybody because the Monday lab completely gets the shaft on that and doesn't do the, that experiment. There's a, Monday lab. There's a Monday lab. It's Monday and Wednesday. Okay. So whoever's in the Monday lab has no clue what's going on with sig figs, which is kind of where I want you to be. Wednesday lab has a general idea. Our sig figs are going to be those first four which means I can ignore those. The answer would be 70.92 AMUs. Okay. Those of you concerned about sig figs, primarily in the Monday lab, we will talk about sig figs down the road. Next week. Okay. No. Second unit. It's not even in the first unit. Yep. Okay. Uh, and because your lab instructor has now changed, I believe it's now officially Misha. I need to have a conversation with her to make sure that she knows that you don't know this from lecture. I had that conversation with the previous instructor, but yeah. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. This is like the one big show your work type question that I can ask on the exam. Okay. We will see Lewis structure show up as a show your work, but the work there is pretty thin. This is the only one that has legitimate work. Okay. For those of you looking at the subtraction and the division and all that, the simplification of that formula, I don't expect you to do that. It's up to you if you want to show that or not. But you do not need to show that. So for work, everything I already deleted or erased, and then you can show me that and it would be good to run. Questions about that? Okay. Let's get out of the math. I lied. Uh, yeah, no, actually, let's do this. Okay. I'm going to pass. If we take a look at N, it's nitrogen. You might say, well, that's not that big of a deal. At least it begins with N, right? Sodium begins with N, or <laughs> NA begins with N, and yet that one is? Sodium. So nitrogen is typically mistaken for students by N, by Na, and also Ni. Right? Ni, nitrogen. That's the first two letters, and Ni is on the periodic table, which happens to correspond to nickel. Okay? Those are very common ones to test on because students often didn't spend the time to memorize, and so they're just pulling from what they've got on the question. Yeah. So that's why they get asked. Okay. BR, bromine, and thanks to Wolf up here, we also have an understanding of why I would have picked that one. Boron is a symbol B. Okay. Silver, most people pick that one up just because they've seen it before, okay. but totally doesn't seem to match the name. Potassium. It is K, not P. Okay. P is phosphorus, not potassium. 
Hi. Uh, what is the most important step in the scientific method? Sharing your information. Uh, experimentation. Experimentation. Failure. Come on. <laughs> That's not in the Failure is the important step of our scientific method. It needs to <laughs> fail, and we need to then adjust and learn from that failure and reiterate. Okay. That's my opinion. Okay. Might be relevant if you looked at you know practice exams. Okay. Yes, you have practice exams on Canvas under the folder that says old exams. <laughs> chapter 5. So what we're going to do is skip chapter 4 for the moment and stop looking at or not look at orbitals for the moment and look at the context that we've built already. How does that apply into our periodic table? Okay. We've got a couple versions of periodic tables shown on the on our projector here. Those don't really match what's going on in front of us. Why would we change how we present the periodic table? Depends on what we're trying to present. The upper left one, I actually know. It also says on it what it's trying to present. It's looking at the relative abundance. So the larger the symbol, the more abundant it is. And I believe that is on Earth, but I'm not positive. Okay. Why are the other ones formatted in their fashions? Okay. Well, the authors of those tables were trying to highlight some other aspect of the elements, and so reformatted the periodic table to reflect what they wanted. Okay. So there are various ways to change how we perceive the periodic table to highlight certain aspects of information. Okay. For the most part, you will only work with the periodic table that we have in the front of the room, because that is the one that is most consistent and generally used uh, commonly across the world. Okay? So, stuff that comes out of this. Notice in this section we have lots of scientists' names popping up again. I don't remember any of the scientists' names, so don't panic. Well, there's one I remember. So don't panic about the names. Okay? But initially, 1829, Dob Reiner looked at the periodic table or looked at what he had access to and noticed that elements were grouped according to triads. We had groups of three, okay? potassium, uh, sodium, and lithium. Okay? Three materials all reacted very, very similarly with their chemical environment, but they reacted differently than beryllium, magnesium, and calcium. So those would be separate triads. If we take a look at our periodic table, do we see groups of three anywhere on it cleanly? No. Why did he see groups of three when we clearly don't have that now? We didn't have that. Close. It's a little bit more than we didn't have that. What's that? There were less elements. So since the origin of time, we've been more and more elements have been created. No, exactly right. Okay, it's the discovery. Okay, at that point in time, they didn't have access to all of the elements because they hadn't found them. They hadn't purified them. They hadn't isolated them. So he only worked with what he had, and that's why we came up with triads. Why might Dobreiner with our triads be like kind of a famous thing? Like, ooh, oh my gosh, he found triads. That's super cool. We heard triads before anywhere else? Music. Music? Uh, the Chinese. Yes. The ch Chinese what? The triads. Chinese. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Chinese mafias. <Sorry. laughs> okay. <laughs> hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago, did we have lots of religion? Yeah, nearly everybody had some form of religion. There's a lot of religion now, but it's starting to kind of change a little bit. And in religion, we have the Holy Trinity. Okay. So this is going to be a big, oh my gosh, look at this discovery. It ties back to our core beliefs and religious systems. It ties back to music that we've been studying for hundreds of years. Okay. That's kind of an origin behind this, and that's why his theory is going to hold a little bit more weight, at least initially. Then someone comes along, and we find more elements. So in 1865, after we found more elements, Newlands comes through and says, we're really going to organize this according to groups of seven. Right? And we look at the periodic table, do we see anything close to a group of seven? And it's actually interesting on this groups of seven. You might be darn close to seeing seven rows. It looks like there's nine. The two bottom rows are actually inserted into the periodic table. That would make it too long. Okay, so we have numbers of rows. 
Okay? But that's not the groups of seven he's referring to. He's referring to the groups of seven in a similar way to Dob Reiner as the, as the um, triads. Lithium, sodium, potassium. Then he noticed beryllium, magnesium, calcium. Then he noticed boron, aluminum, gallium, carbon, silicon, germanium, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic. Okay. How many columns do I have if we ignore the middle section? Seven. Seven. Okay. Or how many, actually? Eight. We have eight. Okay. 1865, we actually didn't know about this last column. Okay. Those are all noble gases, not easy to work with. In theory, we'll talk about those briefly today. Not discovered yet. So we saw groups of seven. That's the seven groups he's talking about. Okay. He turned this into the theory of octaves, or a law of octaves, because if we look at music, we have seven notes that then repeat Right? Yeah. Repeat on the eighth note at a higher octave or lower octave, depending on how you want to, direction you want to go. Yay. Okay. Why are we looking at octaves? We have a parallel somewhere else in our world. That's why we ended up looking at that theory, okay? or accepting that primarily. Okay. He went through and organized according to increasing atomic mass. Okay. Mendeleev. That's the important name to remember. It's considered the father of the periodic table. If we go through and look at his proposal, our elements repeat at regular intervals when arranged according to atomic mass. Isn't that exactly what Newland said? Well, yeah. Why do we care about Mendeleev and not Newland's? Uh, we could run into a debate of who called who what when. Okay. The biggest reason for Mendeleev is right in kind of the middle of his periodic table. So he's got a list of his elements. And we notice we have these weird words, echa, echa, echa. What does that echa mean? Wasn't he able to predict? Those echas are him saying, something should be here. You haven't found it yet, rest of the scientific community. Go find this. Okay, prove I'm right. He was able to determine the gaps. He was able to determine the gaps based off the organization of his periodic table. So those echas, that first echa there, I believe is called echa aluminum, meaning that element, whatever it may be, is similar to aluminum. Right? And he went through and named his species like that to those gaps. People may have thought he was crazy. That's perfectly fine, until somebody goes through and discovers that element and says, here it is. Mendeleev goes, see, I'm right. Okay. Take it a step further. They go, here it is, and here are all the properties that it has. And Mendeleev goes, double boom. I got all those right, too. Okay. That's why we point out Mendeleev. Interestingly enough, he also said there were a lot of other elements that he was completely wrong about. Completely and utterly failed. But the two or three times that he was right, and so accurately right, is enough that we now give him credit for everything. Okay? Everybody looks at our successes. We rarely look at our failures. Okay? So here's his prediction of new elements. Eka silicon was his prediction in 1869. So we got all those properties listed for Eka silicon. Okay? In 1886... Not perfect, but maybe the average age of this classroom, okay, in that time span of our existence, our collective existence, someone then later made that discovery for that element. Look at the property comparisons. I mean, it's one thing for me to say, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow. It's another thing for me to say, it's going to rain at this location and this many inches this many people will be affected by it. That's pretty much what Mendeleev did with, with his predictions. That's why we give him credit. Right? And it's not even tomorrow, because I could be like, well, it's, it's, I got clouds. This is 20 years later he's making these predictions. That's pretty phenomenal. Right? So that's why we give him credit. Right? As we continue kind of through the history 
of the periodic table, we encounter the noble gases. That's that last column, all red. Right? <clears throat> Those were discovered by Ramsey. I don't know why he's not up there. I should have put his name up there. Um, not an easy process to isolate those compounds or those elements. Why might those elements be difficult to isolate? They're gases. Right? We can't see gases. So how does he do this? Well, he takes a giant bag and he captures a bunch of gas and then he passes through that, that gas through a bunch of cold filters. Whatever collects in those cold filters, he can then study. And if he's done it properly, he can go through and isolate the various gases out of our atmosphere. If we go back and look at abundances, what are the abundances of our noble gases? Pretty low. So he's taking a lot of bags. Where is he getting them? The experimental design, that's a good question. I have not looked at that to figure it out. You add to it, you're looking at 1894s. Where is he Where is he? In the air. It's, it's naturally present in the air. So we could take a bag and grab a couple atoms of krypton. We can't identify atoms. We have to isolate several bags to get it up to thousands or millions or billions of atoms to actually be able to analyze it. It's fascinating. Yeah. I think it's a little bit more scientific than just running through the neighborhood with a bag. Okay, but it's not that far off. I like to think this seems kind of like off base, but how did he even know what to look for? It's gas. That's a good question. Why would anybody say, let's look at gas? Okay. How many of you have said, oh, there's a gas molecule I just walked into? <laughs> okay, probably not. When we look out, we don't see the gas. So if I don't see gas, if I don't see anything, what do I say? Nothing there. There's nothing there. And yet, what happens if I take a bell jar and put that over a mouse? mouse the mouse dies. It doesn't die right away. It takes time. Why does it take time to die? Runs out of oxygen. Okay. Runs out of oxygen. But what's oxygen? Right. It's a gas. There is something inherent in that air that is allowing us to live. What is that something? So by making those secondary observations, we can start to say, I want to look at this. I want to look at this nothing and find out what is in that nothing. Maybe it is nothing. Maybe it's something. In this case, it happened to be something. Okay. Mosley, 1913, so way on down the line, discovered nuclear charge. Okay. Nuclear charge is coming from our protons. Right? and identifying the nuclear charge. So Rutherford said we have a nuclear charge, but didn't identify what it was for each element. Mosley went through and said, actually, if I take hydrogen, the nuclear charge is? One. one. If I take helium, the nuclear charge is? Two. Lithium? Three. Three. So we looked at that charge. Because of that, he then went through and said, okay, we've got a periodic table that is currently organized according to atomic mass, but there's some weird stuff. There's some sections that don't line up right. For instance, take a look at iodine. So this is going to go to Esmeralda and Wolf. Take a look at iodine. Tellurium, iodine, xenon. Tell me what happens to the mass. So tellurium is 127. Iodine is 126.9. Xenon is 131. If we look at every other place on the periodic table, guess what happens to the atomic mass as we move from element to element? It goes up. Iodine, it goes down. That's an exception to organizing the periodic table according to atomic mass. So those exceptions were difficult to reconcile with the theory until Mosley said, well, actually, if we organize according to the atomic number, it makes sense. Because of that, we now look at our periodic table being organized according to the atomic number or our nuclear charge. This is what's known as the periodic law, okay? increasing atomic number. That's where it's coming from. Okay? We continue to level up chapter four, second half of chapter four, with Niels Bohr looking at where electrons exist, and that takes us to the final organization we see here. Because if it was just sequencing by number, 
or the atomic number, we wouldn't have the organization we have. So if, once we understand a little bit more about electrons, we can shift to the final form of our periodic table. But we need to get there first. Okay. Before we get there, some important things to pull out of it. We end up with these two words, groups and periods. Those two words are super commonly used in reference to the periodic table. You need to know what they mean. Okay. The group is a column, okay, a vertical column, sometimes also known as a family. The horizontal row is the period, sometimes also referred to as the series. Okay. Notice that if we look at the columns, a lot of them have a name associated with them. But very few rows have any names associated with them. Why might that be the case? Because the rows have consist of all the different groups. Okay, so the rows consist of all the different groups, but by the same token, I could say the column consists of all the rows. Do rows have different properties than the columns? We get different properties between rows and columns. Remember how we talked about the triads? I said sodium, lithium, or sorry, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Where's sodium? Frick, start with lithium, sodium, and potassium. They're all in the same column. Why did Dobreiner group them together? They reacted the same with their environment. Guess what we fall, or what falls out of this organization, the periodic table? Everything within the same group or family reacts the same way. It has the same chemical properties. Everything in a row, we actually don't know why they're in a row yet, believe it or not. We don't have that context. But everything in the same column reacts the same. Well, if they all react the same, okay, or they all look the same, like your brother or sister, okay, how does the rest of the world know that? A horrible example of this because I changed my name, but let's let's go backwards in time to when I had the same name. Michael Davis Allen, my brother is Kevin Davis Allen. My youngest brother is Peter Davis Allen. We keep the same name. What does that do for us? Or what does that do for you? You now know that we're related. We have a connection. We now have that same idea happening with the periodic table. Our groups can get called by different names. Those names are historical in origin. Okay? So you end up with your alkali metals because when they were first looking at those metals and how they responded to different environments, that's where they brought in the concept of alkali as a word, okay? which is Greek or Latin or something like that that's not super relevant for this. All right? But we now know that any metal that's in that column can get referred to as the alkali metals. All right, well, that's convenient because the next column is called something totally different, right? Totally not the alkali metals. It's called the alkali earth metals. Oh, crap. It's the similar name. How do you differentiate those two? One says alkaline earth. One says alkali. How do I remember to not get those confused? Could say they're in a different row. 15 years of my life, arguably 13 years of studying chemistry, 15 years studying it. In the 13th year, I finally figured out a way to not get those two confused. 13 years of doing this. So number one, it's clearly really important that we need to know those, right? Okay. First column has how many words in it before metal? Two. One. First column has one. It is the alkali metals. The second column has how many words before metals? Two, there it is. What? <laughs> Stupid? Yes, but I now know it. <laughs> and I can answer that question. You never it. Your first column is your alkali metals, the second column is the alkaline earth. Two words. Okay? Yeah, if it's stupid and it works, it's arguably not stupid, but it still makes me look like an idiot. But that's okay. I'm used to that. Two more columns that are really important to know your halogens and your noble gases. Okay. Those get referenced a lot. The noble gases is the complete far right of the periodic table. Remember, those were the last ones discovered okay, as a class. Why were they the last ones discovered? 
They're gases and uh, there's less things in the noble gas column than there are in the halogen column. There are abundance in the world. Okay, so we can reference abundance. Yeah. I would argue that the abundance for that very bottom row is less than that column. So I'll, I don't quite accept abundance. Full outer shell is an interesting word to choose because we haven't done that in the lecture yet, but you're correct. What is the reactivity of our noble gases? Very, very, very low. Think about the nobility. How many of you are a king, queen, prince, or princess? No, but none, of, none of you are that. How come we don't have any kings, queens, princes, or princesses? Because they are nobility. They're in their castle with their billions of dollars and whatever you want to describe them as. And they are now paying a private tutor to teach them about science. They don't have to deal with the rest of us. Okay? What does that mean? The nobility are at this higher class where they ignore the rest of us. Guess what's happening with our noble gases? Same thing. They're in this higher class. They don't interact with the rest of the elements. They don't react by and large. Okay? We will never find a compound with helium. We will never find a compound for neon. Okay? They don't react. That's the noble gases. The halogens, I got nothing for that, but they're called the halogens. Okay? Other kind of main group element names, just in case you were curious. So group one and group two, you should know officially. Halogens and noble gases, you should know. The last two in the middle, I include only because for some reason I've memorized those, but not the alkali metals and the alkaline earth. Okay. I've memorized those because I think they're, they sound fun. <coughs> Nictogens. It's kind of fun to say. Nictogen. And the chalcogens. They're just one of those kind of like tongue teaser things. So that's why I've got those. You are not responsible for those. I just want to throw them in just because I think it's a fun fact. Sure. <laughs> Let's take a look at periodic trends. So we're doubling back to Mendeleev now. Now that we've got our periodic table. What can we predict as a property of... Uh, let's ignore francium, actually. I don't want to worry about francium. So we want to ignore that top part. We're going to jump to the bottom. Given the above information, what is a reasonable density for potassium? Okay. How can we answer that question? Averages. Okay, so the average of 53 and 97 is 0.75. So the density for potassium is 0.75. Okay, so don't tell me it's just averages then, because you're saying 0.75 is wrong, and I just did an average. Take the average of sodium and rubidium. Why do I want to take the average of sodium and rubidium? What am I pointing at? The periodic table. Where is potassium? In between sodium and rubidium. So I could take an average of those two values. Okay. Why can I take that average? What else am I noticing within the densities that allows me to say it's somewhere in between those? What happens as I move from lithium to sodium? The density increases. What happens if I move from sodium to rubidium? The density increases a lot. Rubidium to cesium. It increases. So if potassium is somewhere in the middle of that, its density, matching the data that I have access to, should increase. So you find the slope of the line. And then you... I'm effectively trying to find the slope of the line if we really want to get mathematical on it. For those of you that don't want to plot that, don't worry about it, but that is technically what you're doing. Right. Right. Yes. You're just finding the average between. So if we took a decent average, what do we get? One point two five purple was an awful color. One point two five. How else could we interpret the data to get a value? Isn't 
What's that? You're saying you want to add these two and then do what? Oh, no. Okay. How much did it increase from lithium to sodium? It's roughly 0.4, right? Uh, it's roughly 0.5, sorry. How much did it increase on the bottom? So it's increasing, but it's not increasing as much. So maybe the increase in between is going up by, I don't know, 0 0.4. So I could guess maybe 1.4. 1.4 1 seems a little high. It's getting awfully close to the 1.53. So maybe I'll kind of take it in between maybe about 1.3. Do you understand what we did? Use the information given to come up with a guess. How could I ask this on an exam? I ask that exact same question, and I give you those answer choices. Impossible to tell. Okay. Based off of the information that we have at hand, our answer becomes 1.23. Why is 0.72 not a valid one? It's lower than sodium. According to our trend, the visible trend, it increases. Sodium doesn't make sense, or shouldn't be lower than sodium. 1.71, it's okay. Too high. Too high. Okay. Should I be able to make a reasonable guess? Yes. Yes. So impossible to tell doesn't make sense. So the answer I should put in is 1.23. Okay. Using science and the knowledge we have of evaluating trends, that is what I want you to get out of this class. It is the process behind it. After we do process, what do we then have to do? Test it. So we'd go out and we'd look it up. What is the density of potassium? For the first time in probably three years of people looking at this slide, a couple of people happened to look at the footnote, which I had intentionally erased so you couldn't see it. Note the density of potassium is slightly less than that of sodium. Small irregularities in group trends are not unusual. So actually... What is the actual density of potassium? 0.86. Does that change the answer to the multiple choice question? No. no, it does not. Okay, That's the biggest thing I want you to get out of this. You follow the information you have access to. I do not expect you to memorize densities. I expect you to follow trends. Right? It is the process, not the fact. Does that make sense? Thank you. I like the whole head nods. That makes me happy. Or was I too intense? And I, I'm not saying no. Right? So let's take a look at predicting chemical properties. Right? And I'm going to shorten this one a little bit. I'm not going to make you do the activity. Right? Members of a family have similar chemical properties. That was the whole point of why we called them families okay, or groups. All the alkali metals have oxides of the general form M for metal. Two metals for every one oxygen. So if I look at lithium after it's reacted with oxygen, it has the form Li2O. Two lithiums, one oxygen. If I look for sodium, which is right under lithium, Na2O, right? Make sense? Okay. We now have just a general fact. What can we do with that fact? Well, that's where the exam, possible exam question could come in. Okay. It's not easy to think about possible exam questions. Is this something that you should be doing as we talk about the material? What grade do you want in the class? You want a really high grade? You should be thinking about what exam questions I can ask. Right? How many connections does oxygen want? We could look, uh, well, it gets a little bit dicey on that. Okay. I know where you're going, but we don't want to bring oxygen into this for this trend. So let's look at a possible example. That is a trend, yes, but that doesn't tell us anything about the metals. We're looking at our families. The whole point is to get access to, we have similar chemistry within a family. 
oxygen's consistent across all of those, I don't learn anything about oxygen with respect to the families. So if I take a look at a compound, A-L-X-O-Y. The X and the Y are variables. I don't know what those are. I want to know what those are. Okay? So what I'll ask is, what is a possible formula for aluminum oxide given the following information? Uh, Li2O. Uh, I changed my mind. I don't want that one. Na2O. Uh, SiO2. MgO2. Whoops. MgO. And sorry, I ran out of space, so we'll throw it on the other side. Indium 2O3. So our multiple choice answers would be okay, A, B, C, D, right? What is the answer? Right. I'm trying to figure out information about what element? Aluminum. Aluminum. Okay. And how it reacts with oxygen. Okay. Well, I don't know how aluminum reacts with oxygen, but I do know that aluminum reacts the same with oxygen as every element in its family. Its family happens to be on the vertical axis. Is sodium on the same axis as aluminum? No, notice it's in the same row, but the row is wrong, okay? So sodium is an invalid comparison. I cannot compare to that, which then means that formula is wrong. What about silicon? Silicon is right smack dab next to aluminum, aluminum, but it's in the row, not the same column. It has to be in the same column. So silicon is also wrong. Magnesium, notice again, same row, also wrong. Where is indium? It's in the same column. It's in the same column. I can extrapolate and say that the most likely formula for aluminum oxide is going to be the same as it is for the indium, Al2O3. Make sense? Periodic trends, this is a big one that I really wanted to get to, so that's good we got here. We got two periodic trends that we can look at, or so we got a lot more than that, but there's a big one here on size. So the first question that we want to look at here is what is our measure of size? What is, be, what is being measured with size? The atomic radius. The atomic radius. Okay. What contributes to the atomic radius the most? We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Which contributes to the radius? The electrons. Why not the protons? They're in the nucleus, which is a marble in comparison to the superdome of the atom. Okay. So I'm concerned about the electrons. So as I go from hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, with how many electrons? One. To neutral francium, with how many electrons? 87, okay, neutral to balance out the protons, which of those would I expect to be larger? 87 should be bigger than 1. I have 87 electrons versus 1 electron. That 87 is going to take up more space. And guess what? We're right. So cool. As we look down a column, what happens to the size? It gets bigger. Perfectly valid. Okay. Well, that's our column. We also have to look at rows. row. What's our trend for the row? The atomic radius decreases as we go left to right across the period. That's a bit irritating because we switched increase to decrease, but not that big of a deal, right? Because neon has more electrons than lithium, so I would expect neon to be bigger. bigger. So as I move from left to right, I'm saying it gets bigger. Is that what that statement says? No. No. What does that statement say? Decreases. 
decreases. But if I look at the number of electrons, lithium, neutral lithium, has three electrons. Neutral neon, 10. I've increased the electrons, and yet what happened to the size? It decreased. That means our analysis for saying more electrons means bigger size is wrong. We're missing some bit of information. Right? Another way we could look at it, just kind of pictorially, as we move down a column, it looks nice, it gets bigger. Across our row, it does get smaller. Does it get smaller by a lot? Not a whole lot, but enough that in a general chemistry class, we say it gets smaller left to right. right? Why might that happen? Well, it goes back to a very important process that we started this whole conversation with. What are we looking at when we're deciding size? Protons, neutrons, or electrons? The electrons. We know where the protons are. They're in the nucleus. We know where the neutrons are. They're in the nucleus. Where are the electrons? Outside. Outside. Where? Outside. Okay. Just zipping around. My shirt is outside my body, so I, I could show up to work or class one day, and I could be wearing my shirt on my legs. No. Why not? It goes in a specific place. It turns out electrons exist in very specific locations. Those locations are known as our orbitals or our orbits. Okay. That is getting to our wave nature of light because the wave nature of light is how we determined those orbits. Okay. Unfortunately, we'll have to pick up there on Monday. That chapter, in my opinion, is brutal. Most students struggle with it. Before we completely panic and leave, this slide is important. This slide shows metallic character and atomic radius. You might say that's not a big deal. Right? If I ask questions about atomic radius, you might need to go back to the periodic table and just say, well, where is it bigger or smaller? You could memorize those trends. Perfectly valid. Right? That is a new concept, right? How many of you have memorized that concept already? Ouch. The rest of you potentially have a lot of work to do. Or, or what? The instant you get to your exam, after I allow you to start it, you flip to the periodic table that is provided to you, and what do you do? You draw those lines. You now don't have to memorize it, it's, or you memorize it for five seconds, and then you can forget it. Anytime you see a question about atomic radius, what do you do? You'll look at the answer that you already wrote on the exam. If you don't do that, there's a high risk of encountering that question later in the exam and forgetting the trend. Because 70, 80% of your exam is what? Wrong. 80% of your exam is wrong because it is multiple choice. If you spend your time reading the exam, first, you are seeing wrong answers. That will screw up how you memorize the, the trend because you are trying to keep that trend located where? In your messy, ugly, nasty brain. Write it down. And with that, 